Just a reminder, I'm using this outline here. Um, so I'm on page two of the outline, if you're following that. And first of all, we wanted to talk about a uh, little bit about some introductory things. But um, we're going to do a couple of parables uh, and finish off on the parables as parables are stories about the kingdom of God. They're always stories about the kingdom of God. So if you're trying to find something else out of a parable that's not related to the kingdom of God, I think you might be on the wrong track. Uh, Jesus taught those stories to teach us about the kingdom. And then we're going to move on to miracles and how what we can learn about the kingdom of God from miracles. And if we again, if we don't finish all of the miracles, um, we'll pu push that over to tomorrow morning and finish that up. But there are a couple more parables we want to take a look at. So if you look at that parable of the wicked tenants, Luke chapter 20, verses 9 through 18. And uh, uh, so if you're on, in Luke chapter 20... And uh, if you'll bear with me just for sake of time, I'll, you're, you're familiar with the parable, but we'll read it rather quickly just so we get it in mind. And then uh, we want to talk about what this parable is all about. Uh, put this up in the overhead. It's the parable of the wicked tenants. And it's about a kingdom unfulfilled and what Jesus says about the fulfillment of that kingdom. So Luke 20, beginning at verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable, a man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants that they should give him some of the fruit of the vineyard, but the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, him also they beat and treat, treated shamefully, sent him away empty-handed, and he sent yet a third, this one they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will respect him. When the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. They cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, God forbid. But he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now, that is a pretty tough parable there, a parable of the, uh, the, un uh, the kingdom that is unfulfilled. Now, this parable becomes pretty obvious, and it's a very confrontational parable. Remember we said yesterday about the nature of Jesus. Um, there were many times when Jesus confronted the authorities and their understanding of what, what theology was and what Israel was and so forth. So um, this parable about this kingdom unfulfilled, the vineyard obviously represents Israel, and then God sent various people to Israel to try to bring them back to the covenant. And what, did, what happened to those people? Well, they were, in various ways, they were persecuted. And, of course, my people, the prophets. Those were the prophets. And, of course, it becomes pretty obvious that the son that was finally sent by the owner of the vineyard was finally killed. So there's, in a sense, a looking forward um, uh, to his own death here. So... Um, so the owner of the vineyard. But, so the interpretation is God has tried to work with Israel, but Israel has rejected even God's son. And, that's, and, and the, of course, the people hear this, and they said, God forbid that this rejection, um, that this is a kingdom unfulfilled. That's, uh, that's what you're talking about. So they began to understand the parable. Now, the result of the parable is very, very interesting. Um, so you've got it on your uh, sheet there, verses 19 through 26. So we're just going to read this quickly, but we do want to see what happened as a result of this parable. Uh, so here he's told this very harsh, harsh parable, this harsh story about a kingdom unfulfilled. And it should have been fulfilled by the people of Israel, of course, but it wasn't. They weren't faithful to the covenant. So in, verse 20, in chapter 20, verse 19, the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. A little bit of perception here. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might take hold of what he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. They asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said, show me a coin whose likeness and inscription has it. They said, Caesar's. 
He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him by what he said. But marveling at his answer, they were silent. So here's this uh, result of this parable, this kingdom unfulfilled. And so Jesus is saying to them, that they tried to trick him then, of course, because they want to get him arrested, you know, even at this point in his ministry. But uh, Jesus said, give me a coin whose image is on the coin, Caesar's. Well, he said, well, all right, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and be sure you render to God what is God's. Now, the problem is all of these people that were listening, who were beginning to kind of figure out what Jesus was saying, they've been rendering too much to Caesar, and they've been rendering nothing to God. That's their problem. Now, in a way, there's even a deeper, a deeper meaning than this, because who does Caesar represent? And what does Caesar's government represent when Jesus says to them, render to Caesar what is Caesar's? Well, he represents a kingdom that is in total opposition to the kingdom of God, because Caesar's government at that day, that age, that time, Caesar's government was a government that hanged hundreds of thousands of people on Roman crosses. They would think nothing of it. The Emperor Nero, a little later than this time, but the Emperor Nero used to hang people on crosses and then he'd pour tar on them and then he'd light them up so that, uh, so that at his parties, his garden parties, the light that was per given for the garden parties was all these people who were dying on these Roman crosses and lit up. Uh, that was Caesar's. That's Caesar's. Uh, uh, government. That's Caesar's world. Um, uh, just a little later on, from the time of the New Testament, of course, you get the Colosseum being built in Rome. Now, there had been, in Caesar's world, there had been lots of gladiatorial fights even before the Colosseum. They became famous in the Colosseum, of course. But in Caesar's government, um, when people went out in that Colosseum to face the lions and the tigers and the elephants and the leopards and so forth, and people were sent out to fight them either as professional gladiators or when Christians were sent out to die in the Colosseum. Uh, before those gates opened and those Christians were taken out into the Colosseum, often by families, by the way. So it's often a mother and a father and their little kids uh, and a mother holding the child. And uh, they're marching out into that Colosseum. And what the, what the Romans would do, would, they would take big brushes and they would brush them with blood. So they would fill this, these kids and the mother and the father and the little baby being held in the arms, they filled them with blood so that when those gates opened and they walked out into the Colosseum, those animals would smell that blood right away and go right for them. And that was, um, that's Caesar's world. That's a world, of, that's a world of hatred. That's a world of bitterness. That's not a world of shalom. And so Jesus, in a sense, is saying, what are you going to render to Caesar's household? Is that what you're, you, do you owe anything to Caesar's household that is uh, such a brutal household, that is such a kingdom in, in, in opposition to the kingdom of God? Well, the, in a sense, the answer that Jesus was eliciting from them is you've rendered too much too much to Caesar's household. This is, a, this is a pagan household that is totally opposed to the kingdom that I'm talking about. And not very far from where we are, a few blocks, I suppose, is the church where uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, he had a year's ministry in, uh, in England, and he had a church in Sydenham Hill, and it's just a few blocks from here, the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Church. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian, he was a pastor, he was a, he, he was a pacifist, which is very interesting, but he knew that he couldn't render anything to Hitler's household, and even as a pacifist, he got involved in, an, in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Now, can you imagine the agony of Bonhoeffer's life to get involved in that way? But he recognized that, in this case, Caesar's household, Hitler's household, was no longer a legitimate government to be obeyed, but it had to be stopped. And, of course, the plot was foiled. He was arrested. And on April 9th of 1945, two years after he'd been in prison, he was hanged by the Gestapo. So uh, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Sometimes you render nothing unto Caesar uh, because Caesar's household is so brutal. It's so, so opposite to the kingdom of God. These people are starting to get the point. Maybe we've given too much to Caesar's household and not enough to the household of the kingdom of God. Maybe we can figure this out. So this parable is a very confrontational parable. You can tell just by the way it ended. It's a parable of a kingdom unfulfilled. Let's talk about the parable of the laborers in the vineyard uh, in Matthew chapter 20. I'll give you a moment just to turn to Matthew chapter 20. Again, a familiar parable to you. Um, 
and we're not going to do all the parables, but maybe, maybe another one or two parables, but parables of the laborers in the vineyard. Matthew chapter 20. Um, I think for sake of time, we won't read the parable. It goes from 20 uh, verses 1 through 16. And um, what is happening in this parable is that the, the worker, the owner of the vineyard is sending people out to work. And he's sending a group out to work early in the morning, then later in the day, then later in the day, and so forth. So he's sending all of these people out to work in the vineyard all day long. So, and then when they all come back in, um, uh, he pays them the same wages. So now, if you look at verse, um, uh, verse uh, uh, ten, 10, why don't we start at 2010? Now, when, they, when the first came, that is, the first who had been working in the vineyard, so they had been there all day, they thought they would receive more money, see? But each of them also received a denarius, so everybody received the same wages. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the householder, because, uh, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and, have, and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So he's, this is an interesting parable. It's a parable of a very graceful kingdom. And it's a parable of a kingdom filled with grace. And this owner of the vineyard is demonstrating grace. In other words, he's not treating people in some strict way. So the people who worked all day, I'm going to give them this bit of money. But the people who only worked one hour, I'm only going to give them a proportional amount. Um, he's, a graceful, he's a graceful owner. And he gives generously to everybody. And you'll notice what, what these people who came to him at the end, what they were kind of, um, what they were kind of begrudging was they, they weren't begrudging, in a sense, his unfairness because they had been given the money that they were promised. What they were begrudging was he was so generous. Well, the kingdom of God is a graceful kingdom, and the God who runs this kingdom is a generous God. And uh, he wanted them to see that. I mean, in this parable, in this story, he wanted them to see that. Let's live lives of generosity towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's live lives of generosity towards our, um, towards our friends in the kingdom of God. Let's live those kinds of lives. Let's be those kinds of people. Um, and let's reflect this graceful kingdom in our own lives. Now, the, but the result of this miracle is astounding, really. Um, here he's talking, here Jesus has talked this parable about grace and about love and about generosity and a generous spirit and a generous God, and we should likewise be generous. Now, if you look down at verse uh, 20, so 20, 20. What's the result? Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, uh, she asked him for something, and he said, what do you want? She said, command that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here he had just talked about the parable of grace and the parable of generosity, and the parable of love, and the first thing that the mother of these two sons want to know is, where are my sons going to be in the kingdom? What powerful place are they going to sit at your table? Well, I want one at your right hand, I want one at your left hand. And it caused dissension among the disciples. So talk about missing the point uh, of the story. They missed it completely. So what Jesus has to do now is be kind of long-suffering with them and to teach them what if they're really going to be the kind of leaders he wants them to be and understand that the kingdom of God is a graceful kingdom, he's got to teach them now about leadership. He's got to give them a lesson on leadership. And there's only one model of leadership in the Bible, and that is the model of the servant leader. 
So a few years ago, um, Army Division asked me to come and, and uh, give lectures on various forms of, of leadership in, from the biblical text. So I wrote back to him and said, I'd love to come, but unfortunately, there's only one. So it's servant leadership, that's all we've got. So we've got to go with that. Do we want to go with that and talk about servant leadership? And that is, that's what we went with. Now, we need to make a very careful distinction here when we talk about this graceful kingdom and when we talk about leadership in the graceful kingdom and all of you are leaders in that graceful kingdom. There is a difference between power and authority. And in a sense, Jesus is trying to get that lesson across here too. Power is something that people have by virtue of their office. So by whatever office people have, they are granted with that office uh, a power. Now, we'll just keep it with the church for just a minute. So by whatever office people have in the church, they have power in that office. However, authority is the recognition that that power is used in a biblical way and in a servant way, with a servant's heart. Then that person has authority as well as power. But there's a lot of leaders in the church who don't understand that the kingdom of God is a graceful kingdom, and so they exercise their power. Well, they misuse their power. And by misusing their power, the people recognize that that power has been misused, and the people grant them no authority. There's a lot of leaders who have a lot of power. They have no authority whatsoever. And, um, and it's better to have authority than power. Um, and, uh, but that's what, that's what a, a true leader in the biblical sense is a leader who has both power and authority. That is, has the power by virtue of the office, but exercise the power as a servant leader and so has all the authority granted to him or to her because the people recognize that the power of the office is being used for the benefit of the people. So uh, this is a very important parable and uh, helps, to, uh, helps us to understand what the kingdom of God is all about. Let me just do, if I may, one of my favorites. It's the parable of the lost coin. So if you turn to Luke chapter 15, and it's the parable of a welcoming kingdom this parable of the lost coin. While you're turning to chapter 15 of Luke, let me just say that th there's an, kind of an easy way to remember um, uh, Luke chapter 15 because there's, um, there's, th there's three stories in Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. So it's an easy, easy chapter to remember for that reason. It's all about lostness and being found and so forth. So. This is the parable of the lost coin. It's, it's so short that it's easy for us to read. So it's eight through, um, 8 through 10, Luke 15. What woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the parable of the lost coin which demonstrates a welcoming, a welcoming kingdom. This is a beautiful imagery of the kingdom of God, a welcoming kingdom. Now, just if I may quickly, um, the parable doesn't make any sense unless we understand the context of the parable. This is a, probably a fairly a poor Palestinian woman that he's talking about in a pretty typical Palestinian home of that day. And in that day, the home would be very simple. There would be one window in the home and one doorway in the home. And usually the business would be conducted outside of that doorway. So you go out during the day and you'd conduct the business and so forth. But at night you close the door and you bar the window because you're afraid of, of thieves and robbers coming through and so forth. So it's kind of like a fortress at night. But because it has to be built like a fortress, even in the daytime, the light in the house was, there wasn't much light in the house. So it was difficult to find something. The other thing is we need to take notice, the whole floor was straw. So here this woman has lost a coin and it's all in this straw somewhere, you know? So she's looking, looking, looking for this coin. Now, but here's the point of the parable and I love this picture um, here uh, that I've put with this because this, is, this woman has not just lost a quarter or a little 
a coin that's not worth much in whatever your currency is. So this woman has not just lost a little quarter, a little bit of money, and then she's finding it, and then she, uh, she finds it. She calls all her friends together, rejoice with me. I found the coin which I have lost. You know, if one of you today, if you lose a quarter or so, let's say you've got a quarter and you happen to lose it, um, and you look around for it, you know, and so are you, if you find that quarter, are you going to call us all into this room? <laughs> are we going to assemble in a special assembly of people, and you're going to stand up and say, rejoice with me. I lost a quarter, and boy, I found it. Are we going to do that? I don't think so. Um, and if, if you do lose a quarter and find it, uh, don't let us know about it. Uh, just keep it to yourself. Well, the fact of the matter is this very poor woman found the, the, the greatest treasure of her life because when she was married, there was a, she had a, a wedding crown. That wedding crown had 10 coins laced with, uh, laced with a, a braid of some kind, or it could be a braid like we see here. Um, and that's the most precious thing she owns. There's nothing more precious in her life. And as poor as she is, she would never sell that heirloom to, in order to make some money to buy some bread or something like that. That stays in the family. That's the most precious thing she has. It's the most precious thing she owns. And here you see this woman uh, looking at her, her headband, in a sense, and looking at the coins. So um, uh, she lost a coin, but the coin was beyond value. You couldn't put a value on this coin. It was so important to her. It was her whole life, in a sense. And uh, she lost that, and then she found that. And what rejoicing there was. It's no wonder she called all her neighbors and friends together and said, rejoice with me, because I lost the most valuable thing in my life. I couldn't even put a value on it. It's so important. And I lost it, and I found it. So I'm rejoicing. So I'm lecturing on this in a New Testament survey course about four years ago. And after I gave my lecture on the lost coin, a woman came up to me, a um, freshman at Gordon College, and she was Palestinian. And she said, I know exactly, she was a Palestinian Christian, but she said, I know exactly what you're talking about because in our weddings, uh, we don't use the crown anymore, but we make a garment and we lace the garment. It's, it's uh, like a hood almost. We lace it all with these very precious coins and so forth. And she had a picture of her sister getting married in this very precious garment that she had. And so now I've I've got a picture I can show uh, sometimes to my class when I'm talking about this. But this is, this is a welcoming kingdom, isn't it? Uh, the kingdom of God is a welcoming kingdom. And the kingdom of God welcomes sinners. Isn't that good news? A sinner is beyond, you couldn't put a value on a sinner in God's eyes because the sinner is beyond value. Now, in our eyes, what do we think of sinners sometimes? It's those people, isn't it? Those people you know, I'm not, thank goodness, but those people, boy, they're sinners, want nothing to do with them, you know? No, if you're going to be a member of the kingdom of God, you've, you're, you've joined a welcoming kingdom that loves sinners and welcomes sinners. Now, I think we need to be very careful here, and a little self-examination sometimes here. Is your core a hospital for sinners, or is it a resort hotel for the saints? If it's a resort hotel for the saints, it's not a Salvation Army Corps. It may look like a Salvation Army Corps. It may act like a Salvation Army Corps. It may do all the things that a Salvation Army Corps should do. But if it's, if it's a resort hotel for the saints uh, and not a hospital for sinners, it's not a welcoming kingdom at all. Now, we'll go back to just one quick illustration from Catherine Booth, and then we'll move on. Uh, but uh, Catherine Booth loved to open core. That seemed to be one of her things, you know? And she loved to take the flags and give the core their flag, you know? So she'd go to these opening of all these core, and she'd have a core flag and plant the flag, and there it is, and, you know, we're opening this core. As near as I can tell, she generally had one prayer that she prayed. So we're going to have a prayer of dedication now for this core. Sometimes they were called barracks, and in the, um, in the literature that we see, she talks about the barracks. But she said, but the one prayer that she always had was, if these barracks, if this core... And I'll use our contemporary language, but if this core becomes a resort hotel for the saints and not a hospital for sinners, he didn't use quite that language, but that's what she meant. My prayer is that the roof will burn down over your heads. So that was Catherine Booth's prayer for that core. So there it is. So 
You've got to be a welcoming uh, kingdom, and uh, you've got to love sinners, and you've got to welcome sinners, you know? The core is a hospital for sinners. So uh, we, need to, we need to remember that. So there's a couple parables on prayer that you might just take a look at. They're on your outline, and we'll, um, we'll uh, skip that so that we can get on to our next material here on the miracles of, um, of Jesus. So the miracles of Jesus. All right. Now, here's where we're going to go with these miracles. And again, the outline, I hope, is helpful. I'm going to give an introduction here. Um, and then... I think, as you, if you're looking at your outline, when I'm talking about the miracles of Jesus, I think of those miracles in four major categories, um, as you can see. Uh, it's Jesus the master over the, over the natural world, and then Jesus the master over affliction, and Jesus the master over death, and Jesus the master over evil. So each of these categories has something to teach us about what the kingdom of God is all about. So we're going to give a few definitions. We're going to give some characteristics here. But mainly what we're going to do is uh, some representative miracles here. So, Okay, so let's uh, give some kind of definitions, some kind of terminology here that, that will help us. Merit, the miracles of Jesus are given for a couple of reasons. This is, this is as I lecture on it, this is a pretty long lecture, so these characteristics would take us a long time, so I'm not going to kind of belabor these, these, but there are a couple of things that I would like to mention about, these, um, about what's being taught here. First of all, Jesus, in teaching the miracles and about the kingdom, Jesus does teach us about the nature of God. And so the God who rules over this kingdom, who created this kingdom, who rules over this kingdom, Jesus has something to say about his nature. Now, when we're talking about the nature of God, there's two words that I like to kind of contrast. I like to contrast the word deism and to the word theism. Deism is a belief in one God. But it's a belief that God is up there and we're down here and there's no connection between us. God, you know, kind of wound up this world, made the world like a clock and kind of wound it up and we're down here and the clock is ticking away. So deism is a belief in a very impersonal God. Now, um, that is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is what we would label theologically as theism. So theism is that God is the creator of the world, but God is also the preserver of the world. God also loves the world that he has created. Um, and actually, he loves the world so much, and he loves us so much, that he's going to give us a task in recreating this very world because we're going to be part of the recreation of the new heaven and the new earth. So uh, the creating process is not done yet. But theism is really a belief in a very personal God who loves us, who cares for us, who has created us, and he wants to be in our lives. And the miracles of Jesus demonstrate not deism. They don't demonstrate a far-off God. They demonstrate a God who has come down right into our midst. They demonstrate theism. Uh, so that's really a wonderful thing. And of course, uh, the miracles are also going to teach us about the nature of biblical leadership that we talked about with parables. The miracles are going to teach us about the difference between power and authority. So we'll see that also in the miracles. Okay, now, if um, for... Oh, maybe I should do one more thing, introduction to the miracles. And that is we should talk here about faith. Because you'll notice that the miracles of Jesus were done for the faithful. They were done for people of faith. They were done for people who already have some belief in Jesus. They know something about him or they believe in some way about Jesus. All right, so having said that, because the miracles are going to teach us so much about faith, let's give one definition of faith here that we're going to use. Faith is taking everything you know about yourself and committing it. You take everything you know about yourself and you commit it. You give it over to everything you know about God. And that is a daily task. And you know what? You're going to know more about yourself tomorrow than you did do today. And you're going to know more about God tomorrow than you do today. And so faith is really a lifelong journey, isn't it? It's taking everything you know about yourself and committing it to everything you know about God. 
truest sense of the biblical word. Could I just say here, and you know, sometimes we say things we don't all, always agree with each other, but we agree to disagree without becoming disagreeable, and that's we love that, and so we rejoice in that. But could I just say here that doubt is not the opposite of faith? There's this saying that you may have heard, but the saying is there's more faith in honest doubt than in a thousand creeds. So please. doubts move into skepticism or cynicism, that's the opposite of faith. You can't be a skeptic or a cynic and still be a person of faith. You can be a person of faith and still have doubt. So what you want to do is work through those doubts, you know, not by yourself, but in the community of believers. So we're going to see that these, um, these miracles teach us a lot about the kingdom and maybe teach us some about ourselves. So let's go, um, you've got this on your outline here in terms of the miracles. Um, let's first, uh, Jesus the Master over the natural world, Luke chapter 8. So we're going to look at two. Uh, this happens to be my favorite category, so that's why I've chosen two. So uh, we're going to look at two, um, Jesus the Master over the natural world, miracles. So Luke chapter 8, 22 through 25. All right, this is brief, so um, a brief miracle here, so we'll give you a chance to turn to it, and then we'll just read it very quickly. Luke 8, 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a storm of wind came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger, and they went up and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even wind and water, and they obey him? All right, well, here's a pretty important uh, miracle of Jesus. It's a very simple miracle in a sense, but an important miracle of Jesus. Why is it so important, and what does it teach us about the kingdom? Um, any, these Jewish disciples of Jesus, the basic way in which they knew and understood God, because they're good Jews, so the basic way in which they knew and understood God was that God created the world. He's the creator of the world. And he has power over the world. That's how they understand God. That's how they relate, in a sense, to God, as God the great creator. Now, he's also the redeemer, of course, and so forth. But they understand him first as creator. So when they study their Torah, you know, what's the, how does the Torah begin? Not with a story yet of redemption, but with a story of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's how they understand God. All right? Now, starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together in their minds because Jesus, there's this great storm. Jesus calms the storm. Wait a minute. Uh, God is control of the created world. Now Jesus is in control of the created world. So what's their conclusion? Jesus must be God. What's going on here, you know? So that's their conclusion here. So Jesus, the master over the natural world. Jesus is showing power over the natural world. Now, I could just say a couple of things about this. Um, you know, I say to my students, so I'm just curious. So just how many of you have been to Israel? Just out of curiosity. So we've got one, two, three, four. Okay. So I say to you what I say to my students. I say to my students, when you go to Israel, I never say if you go to Israel. I always say when you go to Israel. So someday you'll be able to go to Israel. And uh, if you ever want to come with us, to Gordon College to Israel, we do this every other year, come and join us. But um, when you go to Israel, the Bible will come to life. And um, one of the things we do <clears throat> when we take people to Israel, one of the things we do is we cross the Sea of Galilee on a on a boat, kind of a replica of the kind of boat that Jesus was on, and going across that Sea of Galilee and praying and singing on the Sea of Galilee is an experience that you will never forget, you know? Um, now, one time, Karen and I were in Israel. We were staying at a kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee. The day had been a beautiful day. The sea had been very calm. And one time, uh, we were staying in a little kibbutz there. And so we were sitting there by the sea at night. It was absolutely gorgeous and serene. And we went to bed that night. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, a tremendous storm arose. It was just simply awful, and it was scary. 
and every, it was so violent. I mean, we just couldn't believe it. So we've experienced what these disciples experienced in a sense. And, the, and by the way, these in the, because of the geographical landscape, um, the, that Sea of Galilee can explode very quickly. So sometimes you hardly know a storm is coming and then it's on you and then what do you do? So this is a very frightening experience for these people. Master, master, we are perishing. It's absolutely frightening for these people. But they begin to see Jesus calm the waters and so forth and they begin to make, they're starting to make, it's starting to come together. God is the creator of the universe and sustainer. Jesus does the same thing as God. Jesus must be God. This must be God's kingdom that Jesus is talking about, you know? Really remarkable. Could I say one little thing about this story before we move on to the, to the next one? Uh, we'll move on to the John 2 story. But um, when we're on the Sea of Galilee, what we try to say to the people when we're going across the sea, we read this story, <clears throat> not to frighten them, uh, read this story, and I don't talk about, I, don't, I never talk about how fast the sea can explode and all that stuff. I say, I say aren't we having a wonderful kumbaya day here? So um, I don't talk about all that, but we, we try to get them thinking, you know what happened? All the rage in this story, what happened is that all the rage, all the turmoil of what was happening outside the boat came into their lives. And all the shalom of Jesus went out of the boat and calmed the, calmed the waters. Don't let the turmoil of this world come into your life and govern your life. All the things that are happening around you, all the things that are raging around you, don't let all of that get into your life and make your life and say, I'm perishing. Don't let that happen. Let the shalom of Christ, the peace of Christ, that calm those waters, let the peace of Christ calm you too. And when you're in perilous situations, we heard about a little bit of a perilous situation this morning. When you're in those kinds of perilous situations, allow the shalom of Christ to become the shalom around you as much as possible. But don't let those raging waves control your life. You let the shalom of Christ control what's going on in your life and around you. And that's what's very important. I think that's another lesson that the disciples learned. Let's just look at the two passage, if you, if you don't mind, John chapter 2. Because I love this story, and um, Janet has heard me preach on this, and so it's a great story. So um, I'm just going to go to 2.11. This is a story of the uh, water turned into wine, the first miracle of Jesus. So 2.11, um, and here we learn something about the kingdom, Jesus the master over the natural world, because he changed the water into wine. John chapter 2, verse 11. And we read three things in verse 11. So John chapter 2, turning the water into wine. There's so much we could say about this, but, but the turning of the water into wine. But look at 2.11. This the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. So there's point number one. The first of his signs. Signs point to something. What is this sign pointing to? It's pointing to the kingdom. So this is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee. Okay. Um, and then it says, and manifested his glory. So he's manifesting the glory of the kingdom, isn't it? But this, in the Gospel of John, glory is not power. Glory is not control. Glory is not magnitude. Glory in the Gospel of John is humility. Glory in the Gospel of John is hiddenness. Glory in, you know when Jesus was finally glorified in the Gospel of John? When he went to the cross. Now is there anything glorifying about the cross? Well there was for Christ because he saved the sins of the world by doing that. But glory in the God, so he manifested his glory but not the glory that these people thought of as glory, because they're Jews and they're thinking of Old Testament, they're thinking in terms of power. He manifested his glory and humility, didn't he? So, and then, of course, it said, and his disciples believed in him. Now, I, you know, there again, I'm always amazed at this verse, his disciples believed in him. They had, what had they seen? They're, they're brand new with Jesus. They'd seen one little miracle, one little changing of the water into wine. They hadn't seen any other miracles. They hadn't heard the Sermon on the Mount. They hadn't seen Jesus die on a cross and be resurrected and ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. They knew nothing, basically, but they believed in him. So, 
Very good example of our definition of faith. These people took everything they knew about themselves, which wasn't very much, and they committed it to everything they knew about Jesus, which wasn't very much at this point. So they are people of faith, aren't they? Um, and I love these miracles of the natural world that show us how the kingdom can kind of be revealed in the natural world. Uh, I mentioned the Isaiah 25 passage in the spirit of our, our love for Isaiah. Let's just turn back to it for just a minute, if you will. So this, this would be a passage they would be very familiar with, Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. And you can believe that these disciples were thinking of this passage at the wedding feast of Cana. You can believe that it's this passage that came to their minds. Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. What are they thinking of? The wedding feast of Cana, the water's been changed to wine. They take everything they know about themselves. They commit it to everything they know about, about God and Christ in Isaiah 25, 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. All right, for these good Jewish people, what is the one metaphor for kingdom that would be kind of uppermost in their minds? It would be the, the metaphor of a wedding feast. Because in Isaiah, he's describing a great wedding feast for all peoples. That's what would be in their minds. Now they're starting to say to themselves, wait a minute, we're at a wedding feast. The things that Isaiah looked for, we're experiencing right here. This must have something to do with the kingdom because we're enjoying the kind of thing that Isaiah told us we would enjoy one day at a wedding feast. So they're beginning to connect the dots, aren't they? So this is really miraculous stuff. No pun intended, but it is really miraculous stuff. Okay. Let's go to, um, let's go to um, Jesus, the master over afflictions. So I just, let me turn that one down. Je oops. Jesus, the master over affliction. And I'll use John 5, 1 through 9 as an example. Only one example. Of course, we could use so many. But um, um, this happens to be one of my favorites, and so... That's one great thing when you teach biblical studies, you can choose all your favorite stuff. So, um, so this is one of my favorites, and um, this is, the, and so we want to see the miracle itself, and it's representative of the kingdom. Jesus, a master over all kinds of afflictions, uh, John five one. And uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Hebrew called Bethsatha, which has five porticos, and these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. I'm in verse 6 now. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been lying there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is troubled, and why I am going another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your pallet and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his pallet and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So here's Jesus, the master over affliction. What a wonderful section this is. Now master over all kinds of afflictions. Uh, this happened to be a lame man here. Now the result of the parable is, um, is kind of, um, well, not heartening in a sense um, because um, notice verse uh, 15. The man went away, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews persecuted Jesus, because he did this on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, my father is working still and I am working. This was why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because they not only broke the Sabbath, but also called God his father, making himself equal with God. Okay, what's the result of this miracle? Jesus, the master over affliction. The result of this miracle is twofold. One is Jesus broke the Sabbath law. Now, the Torah says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's what the Bible said. But by the time we get to Jesus' day, there are all kinds of Sabbath rules and regulations. In fact, there are more laws governing the Sabbath than any other of the 613 laws in the Torah. 
So the Sabbath had become a burden to people, not a time of rejoicing. It had really become a burden. And one of the things you couldn't do, there's a list of 39 acts of work that you can't do on the Sabbath. One of the things that you can't do is to heal someone on the Sabbath unless it's a life-threatening situation. Now, this man had been ill for 38 years. He could have waited one more day. There's no question about that. Jesus could have done this the next day. But Jesus didn't because he had a point to make. Um, so uh, he healed on the Sabbath. Now, please notice when you read other gospel accounts, notice how often Jesus heals on the Sabbath. He does it a lot. And he loves to heal on the Sabbath because it gets everybody so upset, you know? So, uh, so he loves to heal people on the Sabbath. So he knew exactly what he was doing. So, um, so he, he broke the Sabbath, and he also broke the Sabbath by telling this man to take up his burden and walk on the Sabbath. That also is breaking a Sabbath law. So they, they're really upset with him because he broke the Sabbath. But then he says, look at 17, Jesus answered them, my father is working still and I am working. So now they accuse him of blasphemy. So the second, they accuse him first of Sabbath breaking, now they accuse him of blasphemy. What's bla what, what did he say that was so blasphemous? Well, there's one person who has to work on the Sabbath and that's God. Because God has to keep the universe in, you know, kind of, operating or something on the Sabbath, however he does this. But God keeps the world going on the Sabbath, you know? So God has to work on the Sabbath, but we mortals, we don't work on the Sabbath. See, we're abiding by all these laws. Notice what Jesus said. My father is working, but also I work on the Sabbath too, just like my father works on the Sabbath, making himself equal with God. And that's why they want to get him, because he's blasphemous. They, they get the point very easily. He has made himself equal with God. So the result of this very lovely miracle is Jesus, the master over affliction. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, Jesus has some other things to teach us about the kingdom and about who he, who he is as the king of the kingdom. No doubt about that. Let's just mention thirdly, Jesus, the master over death in terms of the miracles here, uh, and that's John chapter 11. This is Jesus' greatest miracle. It is the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. So if you'll just uh, turn to John chapter 11, that's going to be our important uh, chapter here. This is a very long chapter, and um, so we need to just, we're just going to divide it up into a couple pieces here. So... Okay, John 11, 1 through 4. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. And if the Son of God is glorified, of course, the kingdom is glorified. So this is a miracle about the kingdom. Now, um, before I, well, why don't we get into the miracle just quickly, 38 through 44, and then, um, and then 9 through 11 of chapter 12. So 38 through 44, we'll just get into the miracle. <clears throat> then Jesus deeply moved and came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there would be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I, not I tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hast heard me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that thou didst sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So there's the greatest earthly miracle of Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I did hear a sermon once. You'll notice that he gets to the tomb, and tombs, are, as we think of it, tombs are, are caves uh, in that world, and you put a body in the cave and lay it on a slab there in the cave and so forth. So uh, it's not tombs like down in the ground as we think of it. But he got to the tomb, and I did hear a sermon once, which I thought was kind of interesting, but that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, because if he had only said, come forth, 
about 100 bodies would have walked out of those tombs. And then Jesus would have had to chase them all back and say, no, I'm not talking to all you people. You go back into the grave. I'm, I'm talking warning to Lazarus. So um, I don't think so. I wasn't convinced. I'll just say that. It wasn't a convincing sermon. Um, I think Jesus um, just said, Lazarus, come forth because we've got this miracle working here. But um, OK, so this is really teaching about the kingdom. And it's teaching that the kingdom is not a kingdom of death. It's a kingdom of life. And it's going, to be, it's going to be visualized in the resurrection of Lazarus, but it's going to be completely understood after the resurrection of Jesus. Because, see, as of yet, the disciples don't realize that he's going to be, first, they don't realize he's going to die on a Roman cross. That They don't know that yet. And secondly, they don't realize he's going to be resurrected from the dead. They don't know that yet either. Uh, so this is, a, this is a visual, in a sense, of what is to happen. Let me say just two things about this miracle that are, that are, that are um, not quite, well, they're part of the kingdom story, I think. But um, the f first thing is there are two great people that we often overlook, unfortunately, because we've got this great story, the resurrection of Lazarus. And there's a couple people, but the first one we, we often overlook, and that is 16, 1116. That is Thomas. Now, they've had a little discussion whether they should go down to Jerusalem and down to Bethany and have this resurrection and so forth. So 1116, Thomas. But of all the disciples, notice 16, Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, sometimes you call Thomas the doubting Thomas, don't you? You ever heard Thomas the doubting Thomas? And even if, we, even if he was a doubter, is that bad? Not necessarily. Doubt is a sign of faith. Uh, and it was for Thomas. It was a sign of faith, actually. But we won't get into that story. But let's drop the doubting Thomas and call him the courageous Thomas from now on. Because he shows a lot of courage here. He says, let us also go with him that we may die with him. So there's Thomas, the man of courage. So when you're thinking about Thomas, let's, uh, and let's also, mention, um, let's also mention Lazarus. And if you look at 12, verses 9, 10, and 11, uh, here's Lazarus. What a great man Lazarus must have been. Uh, chapter 12, verse 9. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest planned to put Lazarus also to death, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is not good news for Lazarus. He had just died a few days earlier. Um, he doesn't want to die right away, you know. It's just a few days later, he doesn't want to be put to death again. So uh, this is not good news uh, for Lazarus. Two deaths, nobody should have to go through two deaths in this life. Um, but Lazarus did go through two deaths in this life eventually. But they're trying to kill him because on account of him, many of the Jews are going away and believing in Jesus. What a great evangelist Lazarus was, wasn't he? And um, this great story is a prelude to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem was so magnificent in a sense. It was a defeat in another sense, but it was so magnificent because all these people had seen the resurrection of this dead man and or heard about it. So, now the authenticity of the story is found in 17 and, um, and uh, 39. Look at 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. Look at 17 of 11. I'm sorry, 11, 17. He had been in the tomb four days. And then look at 39. Martha said, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. What is happening here? Well, in, in Judaism of that day, there was kind of a belief that uh, when a person dies, the spirit of the person hovers around the person for a few hours. And because they didn't want to see the spirit of the person in the room, they immediately upon the death of the person, they used to cover all the mirrors in the house. So there was this kind of popular belief that this is what happened. So that um, if Jesus had raised Lazarus immediately after he had died, like an hour or so later, nobody would have seen that as a miracle. They would have said the spirit of Lazarus reinvigorated him, came back into him, but they wouldn't have seen it as miraculous at all. So Jesus waits up north before he comes down south and makes sure this is a miracle because this man had been dead four days. Nobody would have doubted 
uh, the miracle. So this is a great kind of vision of the kingdom, the resurrected kingdom, you know, through Lazarus, through the ministry of Lazarus. Jesus is the master over death, and we rejoice in that. And I should probably should have put 1 Corinthians 15 here um, because the theology of all of this is now found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter in the New Testament. So how all this applies to us is in 1 Corinthians 15. So we are rejoicing in that. So the kingdom of God is a kingdom a kingdom over death. All right? Jesus the master over evil. Jesus the master over evil. Um, what I think I'll do is just, let me, let me, let's just read the text here. Um, and then, uh, then I think I, I need to really develop this a bit. So let's just read the text, then we'll take our break, and then tomorrow morning I want to develop this a bit because I think it's very, very important to work on this and to get a clear biblical understanding of Satan and a clear biblical understanding of the demons because Jesus is the master over evil. But just so that we'll have it in mind, um, just look at the text, will you? And we'll, we'll close with, with the text. Um, so it's Mark chapter 3, verses 21 through 27. So Mark 3, beginning of verse 21. <clears throat> And when his friends heard it, they went out to seize him. Uh, why don't we do, we don't do the crowds in 20? Then he went home, and the crowds came together again so that they could not even eat. So that now, and then in 21, and when his friends heard it, they went out to seize him, for they heard he is beside himself. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons. He casts out demons. And he called them to him, he said to them in parables, how can Satan stand against Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. So um, here is Jesus, the master over evil. And uh, this is really important to develop. So let's, let's leave with this kind of uh, good news in a sense that G Jesus has entered the strong man's house and bound him. That is, Jesus has entered Satan's domain and bound Satan. And so there's some good news about the kingdom. But we'll pick up on that tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. So bless your hearts. We'll take our break for, I think, it's five off now to... Are there any questions before, and then take a break, uh, take a break at 11 or, okay. Are there questions then uh, over what we've talked about, the parables or the miracles? Any questions, sir? We'll, we'll start the microphone uh, circulating around. And um, I was just wondering if maybe you could share some light on a question that I have. Um, like you spoke about from the, the parable of the laborers and the vine, that God's kingdom is an inclusive kingdom. And, yes. Um, but what I find funny is the story of, um, of Lazarus. I didn't know that, so I found that interesting. But he called out Lazarus because there were so many other um, dead people as well. And, um, I don't know, but that's what some people yeah, say. Well, anyway, yes, anyway. Right, yeah, anyway. And also in the story of um, the paralytic, like it said that there was uh, many disabled people yes. were there. Right. Um, so, and I always get this image of Jesus stepping over a whole bunch of other paralytics to get to this specific man. So, um, I don't know if you have any wisdom or that you could sh shed for me on that. I have none. Yeah. I have no wisdom. <laughs> I have no financial spirit. Um, because Jesus certainly had the power just to say to hundreds of people, you're all healed right now, right here, right in this place. Um, so what I do for myself is I rely on uh, Paul's own experience because Paul had some kind of an affliction and we don't know exactly what it was, but he did pray three times that that affliction would be lifted from him. And the answer he got was, well, his affliction wasn't lifted, but as you mentioned in your, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So I, I just have to, I think, I think that story of Paul's own affliction is in there for a reason to help us out with this, that even the great Paul, the great prayer, the great person of faith, you know, even he had an affliction that God, that was not, that was not healed. And he learned something 
about God's grace. And so I always have to fall back on Paul. As to why Jesus, I mean, yeah, he, I believe that people were healed by Jesus who were providentially, by God's providence, by his grace, by teaching some lesson about the kingdom, were meant to be healed. And I think Jesus understood that. Um, I know Jesus understood that, so I shouldn't say I think he, I know Jesus understood that. And so he heals to teach these lessons, these great lessons about the kingdom. But I'd love to, I'd love to know why Jesus didn't do that, but he didn't. And so we live in this very, um, we live in this world which is filled with uh, suffering, don't we? And um, one thing that I do know and am convinced about and is that the greatest heresy in the church today is the health and wealth gospel people. Uh, they are doing a great deal of damage in the church today. And I have seen students be damaged by the health and wealth gospel people. And if you don't know who they are, if you don't have them around, they are people who say that once you become a believer, you will never get ill. You will never, you, you'll never have an illness in your life. Um, you'll be wealthy. You'll get lots of money. God's going to give you big homes and lots of money, but you have to become a believer to get all of that, you know? And then if you don't get all of that, if you find yourself sick and so forth, then um, you don't have faith. Because there's just a sign that you're not a person of faith. So a student came to me, this was quite a few years ago now, and she was really in distress because her mother had died of cancer, and they belonged to one of the health and wealth churches. And so the church convinced the daughter that her mother had died of cancer because her mother, mother didn't have enough faith. If her mother had only had more faith, she would have been freed from this cancer. And if the daughter had just prayed more in faith, she could have maybe saved her mother. Now, can you imagine... Uh, uh, what burden that put on uh, that person and I um, knew that it was I talked with her and prayed with her but I knew it was far beyond my abilities and so we got her some real good counseling to help her work through this um, but I do know that that's, her that's a heresy that much I know and, um, and our people I'm sorry to say are turning on that television and listening to these health and wealth gospel people and that is not biblical or kingdom Christianity uh, boy, long, yeah, I watched my time, but um, we had a dear friend, this was years ago now, a dear friend who suffered a great deal, and on the day of his death, he said, I'm healthier today than I've ever been in my life, because I'm going to be with the Lord. And so there is that sense, isn't there, in, in our lives, no matter how much affliction comes our way, um, we know, we, I love the image of seeing you know, we see through that someday we're going to be with the Lord. And all of that is going to be behind us, you know. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth in which we will be partakers. So we rejoice in that. But yeah, it's a good and perplexing question that we all have, I think. Something else here? Yes. Uh, it's also about the welcoming kingdom. Yes. Um, something that um, we see is that always like some people responded to Jesus and others they were rejecting him and uh, so many people were also like because of their wisdom they couldn't understand uh, what he was talking and didn't right, understand right. where this was going right. and there is also those those verses that talk about that we were appointed and chosen like not everyone is going to to be in that kingdom and right. that is like to me it's it makes it sometimes hard to believe that God is a loving God because yes. it makes it like someone I pick and someone I don't pick like um, right right yeah to me yes. it's uh, uh yes I do think there is I do think there is kind of what what we would call kind of theologically a progressive revelation of the nature of God as we go through the scriptures as we kind of march through the text and of course the high point of that progressive revelation is the death of Christ on the cross and while some people would think that there's been kind of a chosenness, the death of Christ on the cross has finally given us the full picture that that death is for the whosoever. So that idea of chosenness after the death of Christ on the cross goes, uh, goes out the window and the idea of the whosoever, in a sense, comes into the gospel story. Now, I know if you fast forward this just a bit, I know that some of our friends, in fact, where I teach a lot of 
my friends at Gordon would teach uh, predestination. Some, some people are predestination, predestined to salvation, some are predestined to damnation. And so when we're in discussion or when I'm in class and I say, oh, I believe in predestination. Count me in. I believe in predestination. But the predestination of the New Testament is not a predestination to salvation because salvation is for the whosoever. When you look at passages like Ephesians, the predestination to, to, that, that the Bible is talking about is a predestination of the believer to a life of holiness. That's God, God's predestinating will for you and for me, that we would live a life of holiness. So the chosen kind of theme, there's a progressive revelation here, but it, it, finally, it finally is kind of included in the cross. And in the cross of Christ, his death was for, for, for all of us. So we rejoice in that. So after the cross and after the resurrection, there, there comes the inclusiveness. I think he's starting to teach that um, in, the, in the, um, the one that you mentioned, in the parable that you mentioned. I think he's starting to teach that with this graceful kingdom idea and so forth, this welcoming kingdom and so forth. But we don't get the whole picture until after the death and resurrection of Jesus, I think. Well, we'll take a break.